Thanks, Robert. Um, as, uh, as my title suggests, I'm not talking about musical rhythm. That's too complicated. So I'm talking about musical rhythm duration patterns, just to simplify things. So uh, um, what's the motivation? Um, where where did, that, did all this start? Well, my main goal, the big project, is the phylogenetic analysis of the musical rhythms of the world. Think big. Um, for that, we need a measure of rhythm similarity. Uh, an important feature of rhythm is the syncopation, which we all know. And syncopation is considered to be a measure of complexity. So that's how I ended up with, with complexity. And my goal is to discover a mathematical measure of complexity of symbolically notated rhythms, just to make life even simpler. Um, so binary sequences uh, that correlates well with empirical measures derived from human subjects for auditory short individual sequences. So important here is uh, short and individual. Ah, sorry, is this better? Uh, okay, so uh, maybe we should start out by saying what is complexity? Well, that's a big issue, right? We can have a whole semester course on that. Um, but uh, my, my colleague at McGill, uh, philosopher Mario Bunge, uh, he, he writes that uh, uh, he thinks uh, of complexity as the inverse of simplicity, actually. He says simplicity is easier to preach than to define. Uh, I think we would agree with that, uh, maybe, uh, because the term simplicity covers a cluster of comp concepts. And he argues that simplicity is a complex concept, which uh, I tend to disagree with. So I'll try to convince you in this talk that actually simplicity is simple and complexity is complex. <laughs> uh, in, in, in his book, uh, he uh, considers even uh, for, for certain kinds of uh, complexity that uh, he has a mathematical formula. If C is the complexity and S is the simplicity, C equals one divided by C. So really, consider them to be, uh, to be inverses. But yeah, it's complexity, uh, simplicity is one of those things that, that, that we, although it's hard to define, maybe, um, complexity certainly, uh, we know it when we see it, right? Everybody agrees, I think, that the sequence at the top is, uh, is uh, simpler than the one at the bottom. And uh, let me just briefly say uh, some of the, general ideas about complexity. So it's often associated with, with uh, randomness. So for example, Daniel Dennett uh, says, a, he says that where utter patternlessness or randomness <coughs> prevails, nothing is predictable. So it, it's a view that, that, that randomness uh, involves no patterns. And that kind of makes sense again in, in, in the global sense, but not in the individual sense, when you're looking at ensembles in a statistical sense. So, so for, for my purposes, uh, it doesn't really, really help. And particularly, what, what, what's more important is actually <laughs> subjective randomness rather than, than objective randomness, which is very different from objective randomness. People um, uh, have a, a lot of trouble either uh, composing random sequences or recognizing when, when they're random because subjectively they believe that, that randomness should have no patterns, but actually randomness has patterns. Um, so it's, it's different, the, the subjective aspect is different from uh, what Daniel Dennett is referring to, which is more like the, the objective one in terms of ensembles instead of individual sequences. Uh, another uh, area which everybody knows is, is of course, and perhaps one of the oldest measures of complexity is, is entropy. Uh, and again, uh, that's defined in terms of an entire ensemble. So if you have a, uh, sequences that are, uh, binary sequences that are generated randomly by flipping a coin, for example, um, then you have a probability distribution with probabilities P1 to Pn, and everybody knows that formula for entropy. Um, and, and again, that's uh, useless for, for my purposes because uh, in, in this model, Every sequence that I generate, right? I can generate the claveson or just one, 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 or one, zero, one, zero. They all have the same probability. Uh, so that's not very, uh, very useful. And surprisingly, uh, the most useful area uh, for measuring the complexity of individual sequences comes from psychology. And there, uh, most of the work is with visual patterns rather than auditory patterns. And I want to, uh, my talk is really, making a connection between the, these two fields. Uh, 
Um, so that's a very big field in, in, in psychology, uh, linguistics first. Um, they, they, they have a lot of measures, psychology also. Um, and they have, of course, different measures of, of complexity depending at what level you, you study uh, language. I'm mainly interested in, in not the grammatical or syntactic and, and so on, but, but uh, the, the, at the very bottom level, the accents or the intervocalic lengths. So intervocalic lengths is the most similar to our interonset intervals that, that we work with. Um, and um, one of the measures that has been used for a long time in linguistics is the standard deviation of the, these, let's say, inter-onset intervals or uh, intervocalic intervals. So for example, here's the clavecin, right? So the intervals are three, three, four, two, four. So the complexity uh, would be just the standard deviation of those intervals. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, after many years of research, they, they started uh, coming to the conclusion that, that they were doing something wrong in linguistics, right? And that the, the music people had a, a, a better approach. And so they're switching, they're abandoning that measure. And one of their most popular measures now is the normalized pairwise variability index. So let me say a little bit about that. Um, so you, you, you can really uh, get a, a good understanding of it from this paper by Nick Chater, uh, where, where he really points out, and, and it's, not, it's obvious, right? It's not, not difficult, that, that the standard deviation uh, ignores uh, the order in which things happen. And for speech and music, the order of these intervals is, is extremely important, right? Um, so to give you a, a very concrete example, um, look at the clavecin at the top, right? Uh, and let's, let's interchange that uh, third onset, the one in zero for a zero one, to get the clave rumba. Everybody I will agree, I think, that the clave rumba is more complicated, more complex. In fact, a large said so <laughs> uh, yesterday. Um, but the standard deviation is the same, right? So standard deviation is, uh, is indeed uh, uh, quite useless. So what is this uh, normalized period pairwise variability index, um, I decided to, to test it out for, uh, for rhythms just to see how it's doing in my, in my search for this measure that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Um, and um, so it's, uh, the, the D is the, is the distance between two adjacent inter-onsets, right? So instead of measuring inter-onset intervals, we measure differences between adjacent inter-onset intervals. So it would be dk minus dk plus one, and you just add them up and normalize. So uh, that's been very successful. Um, it was first introduced in, in speech studies by Grave and Lowe, and uh, there's all kinds of wonderful and interesting uh, things. Uh, I can't resist showing you one um, study by Patel and Daniele, um, where they compare um, human speech rhythms, so these intervocalic uh, rhythms, um, complexity uh, in terms of MPVI with uh, music and uh, in particular instrumental classical music so no, no singing um, and, and the music note duration so they're comparing vocalic durations with musical note durations and interestingly uh, they find for instance that English speech is more complicated than French speech and uh, and we get exactly the similar behavior for for the music uh, so English music more complicated than French music uh, and about the same differences and, uh, and standard deviations and all that. Uh, I, I did one study, since I'm ma mainly interested in timelines, uh, talas, uh, meters, all these, these kinds of short rhythms, which are the hardest uh, to analyze, perhaps. Um, so I did a, a study just to compare. I, I collected the data sets, uh, these data sets here. Um, some are, okay, my Euclidean rhythms are there. We heard about those in the previous talk. Uh, there are some uh, f families of rhythms from Arabic rhythms, Romanian rhythms, African rhythms, and so on. And at the end, it's not really uh, rhythms, but golem rulers. I was trying to see which kind of patterns are the most complex, at least according to this measure. Um, golem rulers are, are, are just uh, sets, of, sets of numbers on the line such that uh, the number of distinct distances determined by pairs of those points is as large as possible. So uh, they tend to be r really complicated rhythms, if you like. Um, 
Um, so you can see it's kind of weak. I mean, yes, you can tell the difference maybe, uh, and the standard deviations are, are pretty wide for this measure, uh, plus or minus one standard deviation there. But at least we can distinguish maybe be between, you know, certainly between Golomb rulers and, and Keith meters. But it, for Arabian rhythms, Romanian rhythms, African rhythms, it's, it's, it, it really fails. Um, and so probably a lot of you are already thinking, uh, yes, well, if I want to measure the, uh, the complexity of an individual sequence, uh, why don't you just go to the Kolmogorov distance, right, or Kolmogorov complexity? Um, so uh, in case some of you don't know this, and although it's in the literature, it goes by Kolmogorov complexity, uh, 1968, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning it as Kolmogorov chaitin solomon of complexity because actually, the same measure was discovered uh, in 1965 independently by, by Gregory Chaitin and in 1960 earlier by, by Solomonov. But anyway, it's too long a name, so let's just call it Kolmogorov complexity. So that complexity is just uh, defined as the, uh, the shortest length description or algorithm, if you like, that can generate <coughs> that sequence. Um, so that's, that's exactly what, what we want. Now, the big problem, uh, which some of you may know, is that Kolmogorov complexity is not computable. I mean, how do you know what is the shortest uh, um, description or the shortest algorithm or the shortest program that generates it? You can keep looking for it and, and finding shorter ones and shorter ones, but you'll go on there for the rest of your life. So uh, although this measure is, is very powerful for theoretical reasons, uh, it, it's uh, computationally, it's... Uh, kind of doomed to failure. Um, so what, what people have done is instead uh, try to find a, a, a compu an easily computable approximation or upper bound, right? So you search for a while, and if you stop, you have an upper bound. If you search some more, you can re maybe find a shorter description. Um, so that's, that's the idea. And uh, I just want to mention um, one very interesting approach, which I've been uh, 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 looking into, because I, I want to see, since since that's uh, su such a powerful measure, at least theoretically, what can it do for us in, in practice for our, our rhythms, uh, and especially for these short timelines that I'm interested in. Um, so uh, this computational approach to the, to the Kolmogorov complexity was, uh, was started actually quite some time ago, in 1980, uh, by Papentin. And uh, what's important here is that he adds this uh, this uh, statement here, uh, the length of all possible descriptions, yeah, that's fine, the new part is in a, hierar in a hierarchy of description languages. So he describes this hierarchy of description languages, which we can actually program. Um, so um, let me give you a, a little feel of, of this hierarchy. Um, the first level is L0, um, which is just taken as its own description. So it's just equal to the length. So the, the, the lowest level of complexity is just the length of the sequence. Of course, we, we know that maybe in general, the longer the sequence, the more complicated, right? Uh, 128 beat tala is more complicated than the clavison, you might say. Uh, on the other hand, you, you know that, that, that it's, it's very limited, right? The clavison is much more complicated than, uh, than a million bit long string of one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero. Um, but that's the, the, the first level. So that, the complexity at that level then is just equal to n, the length of the, of the sequence, not very useful for us. Um, the next one is more useful, um, the next level called L1. Um, and uh, the, the, the best way to describe it is, is with just a little example, uh, forget the formula. Uh, look, look at this little uh, sequence here, A, 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 B, A, A, B, A, A, B. So you, uh, the, the, com the first term in the complexity measure is just the number of runs. So A, B, A, B, A, B, there's six runs of identical symbols. Um, and uh, you, you can write it this way as A cubed because A occurs three times, B, A squared, B, A squared, B. And then the, the formula is just uh, this six, the number of runs, plus the logarithm of the, the, the number of times each of these runs occurs. So. This one occurs three times, A, so log three, and uh, this one occurs twice, and this one occurs twice, so two log two. Okay, so that's easy to compute, we're happy. Um, 
What's the next level? Okay, uh, the next level, he says, you can, you can con continue this idea of, of, of coding whatever you see. You know, you can, you can study, you can spend weekends, months, uh, years, whatever, looking at your sequence and trying to figure out ways to shorten the description with these kinds of languages. So, uh, for example, looking at, at this sequence here, okay, uh, it's uh, longer than the previous one, uh, you can, you can, re you can if, you, if you stare at it long enough, I put it in colors to make it easier for you, but you can discover that this red sequence is the same as that red sequence. So there may be parts in the sequences that are the same, and so you can give them a name. Uh, you can call that one uh, uh, S1, and uh, some, some other one like BAS2. Uh, you can see how the game goes, and you can just go on forever, right? Uh, trying things. So, so then you, you, you can uh, use the symbols instead. S1, S2, 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 and then there's a B sitting in there, and then there's S1, and there's an A. Uh, but of course, when you do this, when you code some sequence like this one by S1, you then have to put it in there, that's part of the, the language thing, and uh, you have to separate it by commas, uh, and, and this be those become part of the symbols too. So to make a long story short, when you keep going up these hierarchies, um, very soon, as I have found, um, you, you, you find that when you, st when you start being clever and, 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 and discovering more structure that you can see, the description starts getting longer again, um, especially for the short rhythms I'm interested in from timelines. So maybe the cosmography is good for very long timelines. I don't know, we still have to try 128 uh, talas or, or, or whatever, but, but for things up to what I've tried, um, uh, it, it doesn't work. So let me, uh, let me jump over since uh, I just have five minutes left. And um, you can add other things, like if you see a, a mirror symmetric uh, piece, you can code that. Uh, or if you see a reversal, uh, ones to zero, zeros to ones. So let, let me go to, to psychology, because that's where I recently made a, a very cute little uh, di discovery. And um, by the way, psychology has tons and tons and tons of work on this, because they really want to determine how how people perceive the complexity of an individual sequence, what's in front of their eyes. And, and for me now, what's in, in, in the, what they're listening to. But this is a good survey paper for that. But let me go to the heart of the matter. And this is the paper I stumbled upon by chance, uh, just a real beautiful paper, 1968, Alexander and Carey. Carey, psychologist at uh, Harvard, Alexander uh, at Berkeley. Uh, a paper titled Subsymmetries. And these subsymmetries work as follows. So here's a sequence, and they, they studied visual sequences, um, as most of the, the, the literature was. So if this is one sequence and that's another sequence, and these are just black and white squares which are presented to the subject, uh, the, a, a subsymmetry is you look at all subsets, uh, smaller subsets of contiguous uh, units, like for example, these three, the first three, the second three, the third three, the fourth, the five, and, and all right. Right? So you can look at all the subsequences, and all you measure for each of those subsequences is, is whether it has reflective symmetry, mirror symmetry. That's all. And you add them all up. So for this sequence, you get nine, and for this sequence, you get five. And of course, the more subsymmetries there are, the simpler it is. Um, so th this pattern would be considered uh, much simpler, nine, than this pattern over there. So uh, when I saw that, um, and, and, and I'm used to this kind of notation for, for rhythms, I said, okay, let's try it on some, some, uh, some rhythms, some sound, because the, the correlation they got was extremely high, 0.86, uh, with human judgments uh, of visual complexity. So I tried to measure uh, the measure on, on those, uh, those, those rhythm data sets uh, there, for which uh, we have uh, rankings according to human subjects uh, of complexity, which are either uh, obtained by, 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 by by errors that people have trying to tap the rhythm they listen to, or by just making judgments. And um, so here were the results. Uh, for the visual patterns, 0.867, that's the result of, uh, of, of Alexander and Carey. And then our result is over there for the Fitch-Rosenfeld rhythms, we have 0 0.719, incredible correlation. And I tried the same thing with, uh, with uh, the other data sets. They had three measures of, of human uh, uh, complexity, and again we get uh, not not astronomical, 
uh, not su super high, but at least statistically significant, but not 0.86 like with the, with the visual ones, but still high, high enough. And uh, what's interesting is uh, in, in, in all these patterns, uh, in, in their paper, they only had the correlation coefficients. They didn't bother to plot these things, but if you, if you plot them, I think you will all recognize some, some pattern there, right? And the pattern in, in, all, in all of these is that for, for uh, low numbers of symmetry, uh, subsymmetries, for complex patterns, there's an extremely big uh, range of judgments. People disagree about what is complex, but they all agree about what is simple. So all these, all these have cone shape. Um, which, which I found very interesting. So, so that means uh, that simple patterns are simple and complex patterns are complex. There it is. And, and, and the, reas the reason is, is, is why complexity is difficult is because everybody, it's, it's in their mind and it's whatever structures they can recognize that determines the complexity. So that's one of the reasons that makes complexity very difficult. So let me just conclude. Uh, and by the way, um, compared to the, uh, to the um, Kolmogorov complexity, we get, for these visual patterns, we get uh, 0 0.6 instead of 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.86 or 0 0.87. So you can see that this, this, this little subsymmetry measure, which seems so innocent, so trivial to compute, is somehow extracting all the hierarchies. It's, it's, it's not, not just like NPVI, which computing complexity at just a low level. This measure is comple computing complexity at, at all the hierarchical levels. And, and jumping them together. It ignores meter, of course. That's for more research. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, I think I just already said these, uh, these conclusions. Um, those are the detailed conclusions. And uh, for future directions, um, obviously, it would be nice to find a measure so that doesn't have these cone-shaped things, uh, but it might be impossible or too difficult because it depends so much on what the human being has in their brain. Um, but we can keep on trying. And uh, we're now extending that here in Abu Dhabi to, to two-dimensional uh, patterns. I'm working with uh, uh, Reinhard Falkenberg on that. And uh, I would be interested in checking it out for tactile uh, stimuli. Can people detect complexity of needles on their back? Things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Hi, thanks. That was, that was really interesting and, and uh, stimulating. I have two questions. One is, has to do with the Royer and Garner patterns. So for those patterns, um, if I remember correctly, for the more complex patterns, one of the ways the more complex patterns were, um, uh, were shown to be more complex is that when people tapped the beginning of the pattern, they were asked to indicate where does this pattern begin for the simple pattern, everyone said the same spot. But for the more complex patterns, or maybe I'm thinking of Garner and Gottwald, I'm actually not sure if those are the same patterns. But for the, most, for the more complex patterns, uh, as they got more complex, people uh, as a group tended to indicate more potential starting patterns, po starting points in the pattern. More different know, starting points. More different starting right. points, yeah. Right. So, so that's um, another So measure. that's one uh, you know, measure that I, that I don't think you uh, compared here? Uh, with the Royer Gardner? Or is that well, the uncertainty <coughs> measure? Um, yeah, that, these are all the three, uh, sorry, these are all the three uh, complexity measures they had. So one of them is the response delay, I think, that's the one. Okay. That's oh, I see, one. that's the delay. That's the response okay. delay, Very yeah. Interesting. And then the other thing, uh, the, the one pattern I thought was conspicuously absent of the one set of patterns was the Pavel and Essence patterns, where they found two things, two kind of qualitatively different things make, made auditory patterns easier. Uh, one was if they were metrical, but for the non-metrical pattern, if they were composed of twos and threes, they were also easy to reproduce. Yeah, I have problems with their data set because their data set is, is, has, has nothing to do with the reality almost. Okay, that's the extreme in lab situation. They generated everything, uh, all their rhythms by just perm getting all the permutations of the things and they're, they're, they're very strange rhythms. So uh, I, I'm exploring those, and, and they're kind of an, an anomaly. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but what I like about these other, other rhythms, uh, especially, uh, especially, especially this one here, uh, 
the uh, Fitch Rosenfeld rhythms, mm -hmm. which were generated at, at random, but selecting them so that they have a wide range of syncopation mm -hmm. measures according to uh, a mathematical measure of syncopation. Um, they just generated it randomly, and they didn't notice that about half of them are very popular rhythms played all over the world, you know, in <laughs> Africa. So, so it's 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 realistic, mm -hmm. and and, and uh, yeah. So, so I'm finding that, that 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 there's a big difference in results when when you use realistic rhythms, ry rhythms that people actually use, the real timelines, as opposed to these um, synthetically generated laboratory things according to some formula. They 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 cause trouble, but but maybe. Maybe well, maybe it's interesting trouble. trouble. There, was, there were systematic responses in terms of the listener's ability to reproduce them. Yeah, those rhythms also were, were, were generated. If you look at their, their histograms, <laughs> sorry, the uh, it's like the four four. Those they really stick out a lot. So they're kind of forcing the listeners to to, to perceive four four uh, very one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four type rhythms. Mm -hmm. uh, they also use a sixteen pulse uh, sequence. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.